The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, critically acclaimed as an absolute masterpiece by the general public and the last game Iwata gifted mankind before his soul was trapped in the game and reincarnated into a Digimon by the mad sorcerer Eiji Anuma. You've probably read the title and are most likely expecting me to say some rude or passive-aggressive remark about how disappointed I am with Breath of the Wild, but I thought it was amazing. Entirely and completely, an instant classic, a spectacular addition to the franchise that will be remembered as a prominent turning point for the entire series, and, and for having the cutest Link. Nintendo has created an impressive open world engine, and it's an astounding first step into what the series could be. So let's get right into it. How can the game be improved? One of the biggest complaints I hear people talking about is weapon durability, and I... I completely understand where they're coming from. Weapon durability is honestly kind of annoying. Oh, whoops. I broke my legendary golden bishmeckled dripping yellow madness centaur hammer killing goblins and slimes. Now I need to cheese another Lionel. It's annoying, sure, and you might think I'd be in favor of a system more like Dark Souls, where once a weapon drops you can just have it forever and get it repaired in town if it's broken. But I'm... I'm not! I think something like that would actually disrupt not only the pacing of the game, but the original intent of the game makers. Something I think a lot of people don't often respect when making criticism. The game wants you to more or less be a filthy hobo who's constantly improvising, looting, stealing, or killing enemies for their equipment to keep action and combat interesting and varied. So, you know, why can't we, like, craft weapons? We can already craft potions, cook food, so... Why not weapons? Cook up some weapons! This game already has a wide variety of materials that would make this a viable mechanic. So why not just expand it to meet its logical conclusion? Literally all the orc and goblin equipment is just some bit of wood with a bone on it, and you can already kind of do this what with how the legendary weapons are repaired. This game already kind of admits it wants to do this. You can trade in ancient guardian parts for guardian weapons. What's up with that? I remember reading that Nintendo didn't want people over-reliant on one weapon for any length of time, and that the durability was a means to this end. But if they wanted to stick to that, why bother with legendary weapons in the first place? Or for that matter, why Master Sword? You don't need the Master Sword to kill Ganon. Zelda just summons light arrows for you, and then you higgledy-piggledy the boss. If they were willing to break one convention, why wouldn't they break that convention? Or is having a Zelda game with no Master Sword just out of control? But then why is armor the way it is? Most of the armor is designed with some utility in mind, and I can understand why it's unlocked and awarded, as opposed to being more non-committal like the weapons. The climbing set lets you climb faster, the Zora set allows you to swim like a Zora, and the rubber set makes you a sexy gimp fish. All of these sets provide you with some sort of function that allows you to interact with the environment more easily. But then there's a small wardrobe of armor that does nothing beyond just look good or provide you with a bog standard physical protection against damage. The point though here is it's occupying this odd unlocking purgatory. You can't steal armor off the backs of Borkoblins and Gabokos. You have to purchase it at the store like a dork, or grave rob it from some esoteric chest like the amoral clone that you are. What's up with that? Why no armor looting? Or armor crafting? Crafting armor and weapons might add a level of tedium to the game that some people could enjoy, as well as give more purpose and function to a lot of the items and materials the game already throws at you in excessive quantities. Like, let's be honest here, are you really using your precious gems and monster parts for anything constructive, or have you just been giving them to Kilton in exchange for his worthless monster bitcoins? Speaking of monsters, enemy diversity. Not counting recolors, elemental variants, skeletons, there's actually more than 20 different kinds of monsters in this game. Which is, admittingly, a lot, but despite this, Breath of the Wild still feels rather... homogeneous, I suppose? Perhaps it has to do with the sheer quantity and frequency of camps populated entirely by bacoblins, moblins, and lizoblins of various flavors and colors. Seriously, they're more common than 7-Elevens. It's like, so many goblins and... 
Kebablins and Haba Kebablins. At any rate, we're not here to be satisfied with what we've already got. We're here for top 10 enemies that should have been in Breath of the Wild. Actually, top 5. Top, top 10 is too many. Top 5. Let's go. In no particular order! Darknut. Something I think Breath of the Wild lacked in terms of enemy variety was a heavily armored, intelligent, sword-wielding humanoid that could accost Link. I think they would work really well as a counterpart to Lionel's. Instead of focusing on mobility, they'd prioritize cornering you and making combat as personal as possible. They'd behave much like their Wind Waker incarnation. A hefty pool of health protected by an impenetrable suit of armor that needs to be solved like a puzzle, while they defend themselves with an aggressive close quarter moveset. And even with their armor sundered, they'd still come after you with either their short sword, bare knuckle fists, or an improvised weapon. They're a really dynamic and personal combat encounter. Just how absolutely wicked cool would it be to see a stoic dark nut guarding a shrine inside a cave, or terrifying to have to fight one on the bridge over Lake Hylia, especially if he can just grab Link's scrawny neck and throw him over the side. Better yet, just stick him in the labyrinths. Just go full Theseus. One moment you're hearing a faint clang. Clang, clang, asking yourself, is that a... And then you receive your response in the form of an armored Doberman turning the corner and slapping Link so hard he flies back into the CDI game. Like likes. They, they eat equipment. Why weren't these things in the game to begin with? They eat your stuff. I feel like I, I, feel like I don't really need to elaborate or justify this one any further. Uh... I mean, like likes are kind of erotic. I guess people would be more motivated to draw more naughty pictures of Link getting like liked. Can we put that in? Am I allowed to say that? Gleok. Am I the only one disappointed in Breath of the Wild's lack of dragons to pick actual fights to the death with? Gleok first appeared in the first Legend of Zelda, and then again in Phantom Hourglass. In the first game, when you killed one of the Gleok's three heads, it would fly off and attack you as a ghost until you killed all the other heads. In Phantom Hourglass, each of the two Gleok's heads spat its own elemental weapon, either ice or fire. Maybe it'd be too much to ask for, but that translated into the Breath of the Wild engine would make for a pretty intense encounter. A three-headed Gleok that spits fire, ice, and electricity with each severed head coming back as a flying skull to harass you until you finish the last one off? Sounds like a pretty good time to me. Kargarok. I think this is one of those enemies that if it were actually implemented, we would all immediately regret it. But isn't that the kind of response you'd want out of an enemy? Breath of the Wild has no flying threats besides Keys, who are not at all a threat, and Skywatcher Guardians, who patrol a fixed route. Let me tell you, nothing says open world like the threat of a giant bird grabbing you, flying off, and dropping you from a great height. Only to become further offended when it learns you have a glider. Could you imagine how horrible it'd be trying to pull off one of those long gliding episodes and some bird comes over to try and kill you? I don't want to feel safe anywhere. Make it happen, Nintendo. Dark Link. Or is it Shadow Link? Does anybody know the difference? Someone vaddy vidya me the difference in the comments below. Before Breath of the Wild was released, I heard a rumor of an enemy that would follow you throughout the game until it found a convenient time to attack you. I was expecting something cool like the Garo from Majora's Mask. Not them specifically, but some sort of equally cool ghost of a soldier type of enemy. Instead we got the Yiga which I'm not even going to dignify with further discussion. I vaguely imagine Dark Link serving the role as a constant rival and the closest proxy to PvP this single-player experience could offer. Dark Link would be a carbon copy and possess many of the same qualities you, the player, would. Same amount of health that could perhaps regenerate since, you know, you get to eat. Likewise, Dark Link's equipment would mirror your own. 
And just to mess with you, perhaps he could even come charging in on a shadow horse, if you're mounted when he chooses to attack. It's important that he be an enemy that you can personally connect with as the player. Hear me out on this one, as I reach deep into the lore bin. In Zelda 2 Adventure of Link, Dark Link acted as the final boss before Link could claim the Triforce of Courage, with Link needing to defeat Dark Link as a final test to prove his worth as a hero. Link in Breath of the Wild isn't worthy. He died. He's dead. He dead. And we have a new, fresh Link that I'm quietly suspicious is just a clone. New Link doesn't have the strength, skills, memories, nor Master Sword of the old Link. In Breath of the Wild, I really feel like there isn't any enemy with any agency. Most if not everything you run into can be avoided or ran away from, and Ganon is just a thick layer of pig humidity haunting Hyrule Castle. The black shadow of Link's guilt personified in a grim phantom that constantly confronts him about his failures to protect Zelda in Hyrule would not only be super cool, but also add some agency in how character-driven and personal his presence would be to both Link and the player. Just, you know, more so than the, uh, bananas in red pajamas. I think so, at least. I don't know. Does anybody actually give a crap about the Yiga? Oh, you slew our master. Oh, buy our bananas. Urgh. I hit you with the sword. You fall down like a board. With that out of the way, let's just ease back into a more casual topic of discussion. The people. Why, uh, why does Breath of the Wild still follow the fantasy race has to stay within their province rule? I know, I know, I, I know you're going to say, but you see Frisky Gerudo outside all of the desert all the time. And that's true, but it's the exception what makes the rule now, doesn't it? You see humans all over the place, sure, but you don't really see many Gorons, do you? Or Zora, for that matter. Or Rito! Why is Cass the only Rito you ever meet outside of Hebra? They're birds! They can fly! What's their excuse? There's maybe one Rito you meet outside of Hebra that isn't Cass, and he has the audacity to act surprised when you tell him you've never seen a bird man before. The Zora I can kind of understand, because they're extremely long-lived, delicate, I don't even think they can swim in salt water but that still leaves all the rivers for them to travel and expand into if they so desired. Oh, this sounds like nitpicking. It is and it isn't. It's been 100 years and some of the most mobile of the non-humans are also the most secluded and secretive. It makes the world feel far more isolated and alone, sure, but it also makes it feel far less lived in and believable as a setting. Especially when you've got an extremely convenient chain of stables operating across Hyrule, basically uncontested. And Terrytown! You gonna sit there and tell me it's been 100 years and all these people have been waiting for is Link to show up all gangbuster with 110 quarts of Minecraft wood and to find one of each fantasy race with a name ending in sun so some Mormon-looking Mother Hubbard can build a Florida-style gated retirement community in the Akala region. Breath of the Wild desperately needed an extensive and invested Rebuild Hyrule questline, and Terrytown simply wasn't it. Terrytown was pleasant by all means, but it didn't feel appropriate. It felt cheap. It felt like an afterthought. It felt like a town you'd find in the other Zelda games with no thought given to it with regard to an open world. It's just some awkward, anacrostic, suburban development. And maybe that's the point, but you know what would have been better? Something you could actually take pride in, and that would take advantage of this beautiful, massive open world they've made for us. Let us rebuild Hyrule. Let us fix all these sad, ruined villages across Hyrule. You've already encountered them before, burned down, desolate little towns and farmsteads, typically still haunted by a handful of enemies, usually a whizrobe. And you know what? This could have been Hudson's job. You just find him across Hyrule, visiting sad camps filled with displaced travelers. He asks you to clear out the monsters, asks you for some materials. You give it to him and he rebuilds the town. And then the next time you come back, there's a village there with all sorts of happy little people. Now Hyrule doesn't feel so lonely anymore, and it's all thanks to you and what a warm feeling that would have been. 
Traveling across the land and seeing the positive lasting influence you've had on the world and its people. Doesn't that sound more fun than turning over rocks to collect 900 Korok poopies? Exploration is kind of the main draw for an open world game like Breath of the Wild. And so far that's what I've been trying to focus on. Additions and content that could improve the fun of exploration without detracting from the spirit of gameplay. There's nothing to do underwater. When I first got the Zora outfit, I was thinking to myself, Wowee! I bet when I get all three pieces of this, I'll be able to swim and dive in the water like in Majora's Mask. That's gonna be a great opportunity for exploration and make combat- Why is water terrible? Out of all the environments Breath of the Wild has to offer, water has to be the weakest. You can't dive in it. You can't fight in it. You can sort of sail on it, but the only floating vehicle they offer is this awful, pathetic raft. You have, you have to, you have to wave at it with a leaf to operate. This game gives you boat oars, and you can't even use them to paddle the raft you have or a simple canoe. It's, it's madness. I know they can't just cram every single thing into the game, but you can literally see the bottom of some of these bodies of water. And a constant mechanic in the game is the use of the Cryonosis and Magniosis ruin to fish chests out from the bottom of rivers and lakes. They have bottoms! It'd allow for more dynamic and interesting puzzles and encounters with enemies that don't just begin and end with, I'm in the water and can do everything, and you can't do anything. As well as the opportunity for ruins, unique resources, and the return of unnecessarily complicated water temple nonsense we were finally spared from. All these points or suggestions, however, pale in comparison to the single one thing Breath of the Wild is missing, and would elevate this game from the status of, It's no masterpiece, to what I'd unanimously consider to be the single greatest Zelda game in the entire franchise. What is it? What could be so important? What could possibly be the missing piece that would shape this puzzle into the picture of a perfect Zelda game, the likes of which we have never seen before? Fishing. It's fishing. I want to be able to fish. Fishing with a fishing rod, tackle, lures, and bait. With a fish journal to keep track of the size and types of fish you catch. I just want to be able to fish. That's it. You put fishing in Breath of the Wild and it'd be perfect. No amount of one-hour YouTube video essays would be able to take away from how perfect of a Zelda game it would become if you could just fish in Breath of the Wild.